Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, in this short video, we're going to speak about Ashanfara. Ashanfara was a very famous Arab poet. It was a very, very famous pre Islamic Arab poet. Uh, it's believed that he lived about one generation before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad. And very little is known about who he was in details. Even his name and his lineage is not something that scholars have agreed upon. But what we know about him is that he wrote a very famous poem called Lamia al Arab or Lamia al Shanfara, the Lamia of Al Shanfara. And in this poem, he's talking about how he's leaving his tribe and how he's going to live in the wild. And he talks about how it is like living in the wild. And he talks about his distaste towards his former tribe and their character. So it's a very, very famous poem for a few reasons. One of them is to its eloquence. It's a very eloquent poem. And likewise, due to the characteristics that it talks about, it gives a very good idea of how the Arabs, especially, specifically the renegade Arabs, used to live. And that's why it's called Lamit al Arab, the Lamia, the poem of the Lamb of the Arab. And the poem that ends with the Lamb, because it's rhyming with the letter Lamb, all this, all the ending of every single line ends with Lamb, like the, each, every single bait, I should say. And um, it's called Lamit al Arab, the Lamia of the Arabs, in the sense that yeah, and he talks a lot about and he gives a good picture of how it was like living in the desert, the characteristics that the Arabs used to praise and the characteristics that they used to not like, and a sort of how they used to view a lot of things. So it's a very good introductionary poem. So a lot of people, when they start studying Arabic literature, not all the time, but a lot of times they will start with this poem. So it's a poem that a lot of times that people that want to go and start studying Arabic literature, they're going to start by studying this poem. Then they might start studying uh, Al-Ma'annaqat, you know, the, the Ma'annaqat, and then other poems, uh, Shamaq Maqiyya by Ibn Wanan, and other poems like that. But this is one of the early poems that people study because it's short, it's eloquent, and likewise, it gives you a good picture of the characteristics and the worldview, if you will, of the Arabs, and the pre-Islamic Arabs I'm talking about here. So this is just going to be a very brief video. I'm going to speak a little bit about Ashanfara, a little of what we know from him, from various sources. My main source is uh, the famous book by Raymond Farin, who's a very famous, uh, or fairly famous, I would say, Arabic linguist. And he wrote a book called Abundance from the Desert, Classical Arabic Poetry, where he translates and explains very famous uh, poems in Arabic. And he's currently, if I'm not mistaken, a teacher of Arabic literature in Kuwait. But originally, he was actually a non-Arab, and he's actually a revert, from what I understand. But uh, a lot of my, a lot of the information I'm going to be seeing is coming from what he mentioned, but also some other sources. But those sources are in Arabic, so I didn't mention them here just for the sake of brevity. So briefly talking about Ashen Fara, who he was, and then also briefly talking about Lamit and Arab, his poem, and what it talks about. So it is believed that Ashen Fara, a member of the Az tribe, so he's from the tribe of Az, which is a very famous tribe in the Arabian Peninsula, that goes back to present day Yemen. So it resided in the southern coastal region of Mecca, so close to Yemen. And it's believed, now this is it's believed that he existed one generation prior to the Prophet Muhammad. So that's what a lot of people say that Ashan Farah most likely lived one generation before our Prophet Muhammad. According to his poetry, he incurred the displeasure of his tribe and was consequently exiled to the desert. So for whatever reason, and people, they differ on what exactly was the reason that made him leave his tribe and that made him get tired of his tribe and just leave. There's many varying reasons. Some, some scholars, they mentioned it was because of a woman. Other scholars, they mentioned it, because it, was some type, it was because of some type of blood money and some type of grudge that he had because his father was killed. There's a lot of different reasons, not very clear. A lot of it's sort of borderline mythical. But it's clear that some type of fallout happened with his tribe. And because of that, he left and was pretty much exiled. And he himself decided to leave. Historically, historical accounts reveal that Ashanfa spent his formative years living outside his tribe, experiencing a life of hardship and adversity as an outsider. So as we're going to see in the poem, inshallah, uh, when we explain it later on uh, in other videos, Shanfari explains his his tiredness and he explains the the very very tough life that he's living that borderline makes him as if he's an animal that makes him similar to a wolf and that makes him similar to birds and and, and it's very interesting his existence his existence was not one of privilege like the other members of his clan but rather one of struggle and conflict for others so it's mentioned that the tribe that he was living which is the tribe of Benu Salama Benu Salaman it wasn't really his original tribe like Benu Salaman is a sub tribe of of as the big family of Az, 
but he wasn't from that sub tribe. He was from another sub tribe, but for again various reasons that people they differ on. He's as if he was living in this tribe, but he wasn't really part of them. In terms of his lineage, it was slightly different than theirs. Okay, so he did face some type of tribalism from them. As a result, he declared revolt against the Benu Sediment tribe, leaving them for other groups he deemed to be more honorable. These groups were not human, but instead the beasts he encountered, providing him with companionship he lacked amongst his people. So as we see in the poem, he talks about how he's living with wolves and how wolves are better than human beings or better than his tribe because they don't spread rumors. And the list goes on. Moving on. <clears throat> this ultimately led Ashan Farah to becoming a Su'uruk. So Su'uruk were pretty much a type of bandits, brigands. So brigands, bandits who used to be pretty much highway robbers that would live outside of a tribe that would not have uh, that tribal support, but would rather just live as just, you know, renegades pretty much. A bandit, so this is pretty much a tr sort of definition for a Su'aruk, a bandit who was forced out of his tribe and forced to live in the wilderness as a highway robber. So that's more or less what a Su'aruk is. And there are many more, there's, the Shinfara was one of them. There are many other famous Su'aruk. He swore to kill 100 men of the Benu of the Sanaman tribe and had already slain 98 before being captured by his enemies during an ambush. So it's said that because he was so mad and he was so disgusted with this tribe, he decided he was going to swear. He took an oath that he was going to kill 100 of the Benu Sanaman tribe. Okay, 100 men from their tribe. And he talks about this a bit. He talks about how he attacks this tribe and how he has raids on this tribe and how much they hate him and how much he hates them. And how he's more or less certain that one day they're going to get him, Yanni. So he's living the life of a renegade. Um, and he's slain at least 98. This is what, again, some of the sources say. In the struggle, now in the struggle where he was ambushed by, finally he was ambushed by three of these men. Ashan Farah lost one of his hands to a sword strike, but used his other hand to fling it at the member of the Sanaman tribe, killing him and reaching 99 kills. So this is again, Allah Adam, if this is fully authentic, but this is what, Yani, this is what's said, this is what has been narrated, right? Again, some of these things are borderline mythical, uh, but that's how, you know, uh, literature works, right? So it says that three of the men came, he killed one of them. Okay, three of the guys came from, he killed one of them. The other guy was able to cut off his hand. He took his hand, he threw it at the guy's face. Somehow that killed him also. Then the last one was able to uh, to get him. So despite being overpowered and killed, he was one short of his target, right? Because he only killed 99, but he made it over there. He's going to kill 100. So after his death, his skull lay on the ground until a sediment tribe member kicked it with their foot. So it's said that when he before he was about to be killed by these people, he told them not to bury him. He told them not to bury him. He said, do not bury me when I die. Just leave my body out for the animals to eat it pretty much. So that's why his body was not, was not actually buried, but it was just left out there. So I guess it started decaying pretty much. So after his death, his skull lay on the ground until a Sanaman tribe member kicked it with their foot, causing a bone splinter to enter the foot. The wound became infected and led to their death. It does complain of goal of killing 100 Sanaman tribe members. So a lot of them, again, it's not yeah, any, these, these narrations are, you know, it's literature, right? Literature is always, there's always exaggeration. There's always some type of uh, exaggeration and, you know, type of uh, mythical aspect to it in a sense. But there's no doubt that this is a general picture of who Ashan Farah is from these sources that we have. Some of them that Raymond Farin, uh, Raymond Farin, he mentions in his book and anybody who's interested in learning more about the sources and trying to reach more, you know, uh, details on these different events, I highly recommend you uh, go and check out his book and then check, it, get, check out the sources that he uses and obviously go into uh, Arabic sources. So this is a very brief sense as to who Ashan Farah is. Uh, now, Ashan Farah is most famous for his poem called Lamiat al-Arab or Lamiat al-Shan Farah, as we mentioned, right? So what's Lamiat al-Shan Farah or Lamiat al-Arab? It's a short poem made up of six to eight lines. So it's very short each ending with the letter lamb. So that's why it's called Lamia. Lamia is a poem in the Arabic language that ends with the letter lamb, and each bait ends with the letter lamb. It is one of the most famous poems in both the Arab-speaking world and likewise among Orientalists. Hence, it has multiple translations in English. So Lamia to Shanfara or Lamia to the Arab is one of those poems that Orientalists, so people who study the Orient, people who study, uh, you know, uh, the Orient, um, they've given a lot of importance to. So there's a lot of translations of Lamia to the Arab, um, in English language and other languages and German and stuff like that from these Orientalists of many, of all the poems of the Arabic language, specifically pre-Islamic poems, talking about pre-Islamic poems, Lamit al-Arab or Lamit al-Shanfara is one of those poems that Orientalists have really given a lot of intention to. 
There's a lot of translation out there. There's a lot of works in English that talk about who Hashem Farah is, that discuss his life and so on and so forth. So it's it's a very it's a very uh, famous poem. It is studied by students of the Arabic language for mainly two reasons. <clears throat> Firstly, it's eloquence, as I mentioned. It's very eloquent. A lot of the words that come in there are words that come in the Quran uh, and that come in, in in the speech of the Arabs. That's important to know. Um, and the description that he gives is very very beautiful. And it's very well done, if you will. Secondly, the praiseworthy characteristics that are included in some of its lines, highlighting the character of the early Arab. So as I mentioned, it talks a lot about, it gives you a good idea of how the Arabs, the worldview of the Arabs at that time, how they viewed things, the characteristic that they praised and the characteristic that they disliked. Now, giving a brief yani, thematic theme of how the poem functions, and again, this is a lot of it's taken from uh, Raymond Farin's work. He pretty much breaks the poem down like this. He breaks the 68 lines down like this. So from line one to four, the poet is expressing his desire to leave and his disgust with his tribe. So he says, <laughs> So he mentions how, you know, prepare your camels for leaving because I'm going to pew that's other than you. And he says, Yani, you know, the affair has been decided and so on and so forth. From line five to 13, he talks about how he has a new family, which is these wild animals. He talks about uh, his new tribe, which is like pretty much wolves. So he says, what are you doing? So I have other than you, uh, a tribe, which is or a family, which is, you know, the wild, fast wolf and other animals. Then he mentioned also that he has three companions, his heart that is brave and his sword and his bow. So he says, that after what's happened for Adam so he mentions I have other or I have three companions of heart that is brave and a sword that is white and a safara or you know, a yellow long bow. And then from line 14 to 20, he addresses his tribe and addresses how it's not like them in a sense. From line 25, 21 to 25, of when he talks about his hunger, and I quite talks about some strategies that he used to suppress the, uh, the blame, uh, different blames that someone can have. And then uh, line 26 to 35, he describes the wolves that he lives with and how they chase for food and how they counsel each other. Line 36 to 41, he talks about how he's successful in attaining water and how he's very fast, so fast that he's able to beat the sand goose, which is a type of very fast bird. Then 42 to 48, he describes the, the effect that hunger has on his body. So how yeah, and his, his, his bones are showing things like that. And also he talks about the anxiety that he has to be attacked by this tribe and how they're plotting at night to kill him pretty much. Then 49 to 33 he talks about his endurance. 54 to 64, uh, he talks about how he's become physically wild. So he talks about how he's he's not clean, how he has in yeah, any water has not touched his hair and has not he's not he has not like taken care of his hair, stuff like that. He also talks about fear and hunger and cold. Then finally he ends by mentioning that he's pretty much living now with female apex, so like mountain goats, female mountain goats that are yeah, he's so he's so like them that they're comfortable around them and he settles around or and they settle around him. Uh, so that in a very brief sense is the poem itself, what it talks about. And likewise, who Shen Farah was uh, and his poem and why it's important that anybody who's trying to learn the Arabic language or trying to start studying literature, this is definitely one of those poems that someone should start with for a few reasons. It's eloquence. It's very short. Likewise, a lot of translations out there for when it can be a bit hard to understand. Uh, and both in the Arab speaking world and in the you know, Orientalist world, it's a poem that's been given a lot of importance to. Allah knows best.